Okay, uh, thanks a lot for the organizers for having me here. Uh, never been here before, so it's brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, so this is a talk uh, based on a lot of recent work on private information retrieval. I try to give you some basic ideas on the concept and then some of our recent results. Uh, the main results that I'm going to present uh, related to our own work are joint work with Lukas Holzbauer, who is at TU Munich, or went on somewhere else, but was there at the time. Uh, Ragnar Frey Hollandi from Aalto and GLE, who also was at Aalto at the time. A lot of this um, kind of earlier work that I will be referring to is a joint work with one billion people, so there are some further people to thank down there. Okay, let's see. Yes, so as said, uh, I'll first introduce you to the concept. Then I explain what uh, PIR capacity means and explain some known results, present a conjecture. And to solve or prove that conjecture, I introduced two new concepts, namely strongly linear uh, PIR and this so-called uh, full support rank PIR. And then uh, in the end, I'll discuss a bit how we should interpret these results and what is there uh, still to do. And for those who recently saw my talk at the Technion Coding Theory Seminar, apologies, you've seen about 120% of this talk already. So let's get started. Uh, first, maybe a little bit of semantics. There's of course many ways to achieve privacy. So for instance, uh, if I would like to retrieve some health record uh, from a database that I don't trust, then of course some way to do this would be to anonymize myself. So if they don't know whose data or to whom they are sending the data, then I'm uh, preserving my privacy. So anonymity is one way of achieving privacy. Then we can of course use a traditional crypto mechanism. If I just encrypt all my files, nobody can read them, then it doesn't matter that I retrieve something because nobody knows what the file contains. So security or cryptography can also provide some uh, form of privacy. So I'm not talking about either one of these in this talk, but I'm talking about private information retrieval. So what is the case here is that I have several files or records in some database or distributed storage system. I would like to retrieve one of those without revealing the identity of the file. For instance, this is a silly example, but if I would like to download a movie or stream a movie from Netflix, but I don't want to reveal my movie interests, let's say I'm interested in Titanic, so I would like Netflix to give me Titanic without Netflix knowing that I'm watching Titanic. Sounds a bit contradictory at first, but we can achieve this. So this is what I mean by private information retrieval and the files as such can be completely public. Everybody can see what are the movies on Netflix, but I don't want anybody to know what I want to download. So there are two forms of private information retrieval. There's computational one. So this is based on the more traditional cryptographic assumptions on uh, being computationally limited. Then there's information theoretic PIR, uh, so that means that the identity of the file and the query uh, queue that I'm sending to the uh, storage system on Netflix have zero mutual information. So finding I, the index of the file that I'm interested in, given the query is impossible or at best amounts to guessing. So this is what we are concerned in this talk. So, uh, as said, the basic problem of PIR is to download a file from, say, distributed uh, storage system without revealing the identity of the file to the servers, who might be malicious and misuse this information. And then one basic fact that we can easily prove is that if we only have one server and we store all the information there, then the only way to get perfect privacy in this information theoretic sense is to download the entire database, download everything. So then of course I'm private because I downloaded everything, so they can't identify what, what was actually the reason I decided to download everything. But this is obviously highly infeasible. Uh, databases are large, clouds store a lot of information, so we don't want to do that. And the solution simply is to distribute the data on multiple servers, either replicating everything or doing some more elaborate coding. And just a bit of history, this is really not covering uh, everything, just to give a bit, a bit of an idea how things started. So during 1995, maybe up to 2005 or so, 
uh, it was kind of a hot topic, this PIR from replicated databases, uh, considering how do we retrieve a single bit without revealing which bit we were interested in, or possibly a block of bits. But so after this, the topic was kind of dropped, maybe thought of, uh, thought to be a bit kind of impractical because you need to communicate a lot to retrieve a single bit. So then there was a sequence of papers that reduced step by step the complexity uh, of the communication to retrieve your bit or file privately to be sublinear in M, the number of files, sorry I didn't write what M means, while requiring only two non-colluding servers. Non-colluding meaning that the servers don't exchange their observed queries, so they don't talk to each other. And why I put some exclamation marks there uh, is because M is the number of files and you can imagine some, if you even look at your own Dropbox or something, there are quite many, many files. I checked at some point, I think I had, uh, I don't know, some hundreds of thousands of files only there. So this is not a great thing to be dependent on if you want to be uh, not having a lot of complexity in your communication. So what has been happening more recently, mainly starting 2014-15 perhaps, uh, is looking at this private information retrieval problem when we have a distributed storage system. So before that there was of course a lot of uh, research on these various coding schemes for distributed data storage. How do you retrieve your file and repair your file efficiently? So now we are considering this similar kind of um, storage setting and then we want to get a file privately from this system. And so one uh, maybe important feature that deviates between uh, the early work from the more recent one is that in the early papers to account for the communication complexity people counted both the upload so you are the user is sending some queries to their servers and then download which is receiving the file you actually want it. So both the upload plus uh, download, but more recently uh, it has been common to ignore the upload cost completely. And how can we do that? The reason for this is that we can assume that the size of the files, for instance these video files for Netflix, they are very large compared to the kind of uh, query vector which consi uh, consists of some symbols. So mathematically you can kind of think of as your upload being in a certain base field and your download being in some extension field. So we can ignore, ignore the upload cost. And what is nice about this is that then your communication cost is suddenly independent of this parameter M, number of files, which is huge. So it is now only dependent on the number of servers, which can be thought of as being much smaller and possibly some other, other parameters that are even smaller than N. Okay, so let's just uh, look at very briefly um, distributed storage system. So if I have some M files, I index them by these uh, superscripts and then I'm using subscripts for the different file fragments. So if I, for instance, if I denote by X, I should not point at the <laughs> computer screen, if I denote by X I sub, uh, sub J super I, uh, that means the Jth fragment of the Ith file. So for instance, if I'm using a 3-2 simple parity check code, then for each file xi, I'm first splitting them into two symbols to have two information symbols and then I'm encoding into three uh, coded symbols. So it's just the basic bits or symbols if it's not binary and then the parity, parity symbol. So then on this uh, data storage setting, how do I interpret this? I look at all these coordinates and I store this, uh, where's my pointer there? Uh, I store the first piece on the first server, the second piece on the second server, and then this parity symbol, the third, sim third symbol on the third server. And so just to give a bit of illustration via a toy example, so now I have this, uh, precisely this system that I have encoded by simple parity check code 3.2. So I have two information symbols uh, indicated by these subscripts, it's hard to point with this, one and two. And the superscript one uh, denotes the fact that I want the first file, so it's not the power, it's just the superscript. So this is what the system is storing. The boxes are servers. First one is storing the first piece in the encoded vector. The second one is storing the second pieces and then the parity pieces. And what happens now is that the user is choosing a random vector, the length of which corresponds to the number of servers. 
uh, sorry, number of files, and sending this vector uh, to the servers, but adding this kind of indicator vector indicating which file is the interesting one. So we wanted the first file, so we are adding E1, the first basis standard vector, zero, zero, uh, sorry, one, zero, zero. So then we sent U plus E1, which is zero, zero, one, to the first server, and then we sent the plain U vector U to the other two servers. And what they do is that they project their uh, data on the received queries. So if things are binary, this is just simply XORing the data with their received uh, query vector. And then how do we get our desired file piece is that if you look at what is the sum of these received uh, queries, things cancel out nicely and I'm getting x11, which is the first piece of my desired file. I still need the second piece though, so I need to repeat this process to its end. I'm choosing a new random vector and then I'm doing exactly the same thing except that I'm now sending the indicator piece to the second server because the second server is storing the second piece of the first file that I'm still missing. So blah 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 and then again servers protect their data on the queries and now again if I sum up my received, uh, oops, received responses then I'm getting back uh, the, this is impossible, okay I stopped pointing, then I'm getting back my second piece uh, x2 to the 1. And is this private? It depends. So if these servers will exchange their queries, then they can see exactly the same thing as the users can see. But if I assume that they don't talk to each other, then this is private. All that they see is some random vector. It's impossible for them to tell if there was some uh, standard basis vector added to it or not. So then what if the servers do talk to each other. What if I tell uh, the other server that look here's the query I got, what did, you, what did you get? And then by combining perhaps we can reveal the secret. Luckily there's still something we can do but let's define this uh, rigorously first. So servers in a colluding set, as said, they might exchange their obtained queries. So they are kind of honest but curious and they might try to utilize the things that they legally see. So if they start talking to each other then what happens? So we say that a scheme protects against, against the colluding set J if there is some probability, exists some probability distribution QJ mu J, mu J is the probability measure, such that for any I in file index I, uh, if we project onto this colluding set um, any query related to the desired file I, then we see the whole distribution QJ mu J. So basically, if we pick things uniformly at random and then we uh, project this part of the queries uh, that the collusion set uh, sees, it looks uniformly random. And we say that the scheme is a TPIR scheme if it protects against any collusion set of size at most t. So this is kind of a very pessimistic assumption. We assume that any set of size at most t might collude. But what is maybe hidden in this assumption is that we assume that the different colluding sets, they don't collude. So this colluding set doesn't involve with this other colluding set. Otherwise things become quite impossible. Okay, so then how do we measure a good, the goodness of such a scheme? This is by the capacity. So we define the rate of a PIR scheme as um, the ratio of the size of what we want. Uh, against the size of the total download to get what we want when we want to do it privately. And so basically uh, up here is the size of the file for instance and then down here is the size of the file plus some extra that we downloaded to kind of obfuscate. And why I've written size in quotation marks is that maybe more formally there should be entropy, maybe there's some compression, you know, but we, we don't need to care about that. We can just think of these uh, Download sizes as number of symbols that we uh, have in the file versus how many symbols we need to download to be a bit more simplistic. And maybe one thing to note is that um, if we don't require privacy, then we can just download what we want, so the rate is essentially one. Maybe we need to send like the one index that we want, but this will be completely negligible and we anyway ignore the upload cost. And then the capacity is going to be the maximum possible uh, rate for a given, given model. For, in, for instance, if I'm storing my files with NK MDS code, then what is the best rate I can 
achieve. This is called the capacity of NK coded BIR. Uh, then we will see a bit later that um, it is really in practice the asymptotic capacity that matters. Uh, I don't know if there are people working, for instance, on some wireless communications where it's usually the opposite, like the capacity is something you don't really care about pra in practice so much, or you kind of do, but it's usually the theoretical uh, interest is the asymptotic capacity. But here, that's really what's kind of interested, interesting in practice. So asymptotically capacity as achieving scheme is the one for which uh, the limit of the capacity when the number of files goes to infinity is uh, the rate achieved. And so what do we know so far? There's a lot of different constructions. We have a lot of capacity results already proven. Here's some list of the, some of the kind of early works of the second wave of PIR research, uh, now considering this coded storage. And then out of curiosity, I checked what is the most recent paper that I can find on IEEE Explore, and that was some graph-based uh, PIR by Chucky Tamo. Uh, curious uh, thing, I don't know exactly what that's about. Uh, then what we concentrate here is this MDS coded storage and colluding servers, so servers which can uh, talk to each other with some limitations. And I go now a bit backwards. I first uh, tell what we have done and without really telling anything and then I will explain what the actual results are and then how we, how we achieve them. So a few years ago at ITW conference, uh, we managed to close some gaps in these uh, capacity results. So many things were still open and we uh, closed a few of them. For instance, we derived the symmetric PIR capacity when we have coded, colluded, Byzant Byzantine and unresponsive servers. So um, unresponsive just means that one of the servers or few of the servers don't send you anything, also called stragglers. Byzantine means that there were some errors, either malicious or by just uh, errors in the communication. And symmetric means that the user can only get what they actually requested, nothing extra. They don't see any symbols from some other movie than the movie that they actually asked for. Uh, we also developed the concept of strongly linear uh, PIR scheme and derived the capacity of such schemes. And what was nice about this is that it also yields a proof under this strong linearity assumption and in the asymptot asymptotic regime for the conjectures that uh, were stated earlier in, in some of our papers. And this strong linearity is somehow very natural and it's also very practical because it kind of enables uh, implementation over small fields. And why is that? Is that we don't need to, so usually to somehow make your queries more efficient, you split the files in very many fragments called subpackets. And the more you do this, then the more complex everything becomes and the bigger field size you need. So we can, we can avoid this by doing these uh, strong linear schemes. And then uh, even more recently, uh, we got the converse for the PIR capacity with coded and colluding servers that had been open for well, it's not a long time in mathematics, but in engineering it's quite a long time, um, since 2016 essentially. And then luckily there was already an achievable scheme, maybe with some faults in the presentations, but was possible to fix it. So basically what this work does is it almost settles this coded colluding PIR capacity. But not quite, and I'll explain why just almost and not, not quite. So the caveat is that uh, the converse proof requires this technical assumption of so-called uh, full support rank. But I will not tell yet what this means and we don't need to care about the technicalities. There's some very intuitive e explanation behind this that I will give you a bit later. But so why is this assumption still natural, even though it's kind of just a technical thing to make the proof happen, is that all the known capacity achieving schemes satisfy this assumption, there's only uh, one thing that I'm aware of that doesn't satisfy this assumption, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, so let's um, now look at a bit how do you go proving these kind of capacity results. So for instance, if you look at the very first uh, PIR capacity result, uh, this is by Sunan Jafar from 2016. So we have files replicated on N servers, M files. So each of the N servers is storing M files. So then the claim is that the capacity 
is this expression. You can write it a bit more neatly by just using the geometric sum formula. And asymptotically, it becomes 1 minus 1 over n. So first of all, what we see from this is that the more servers you have, the less penalty you have for the privacy. So if you have very many servers, then you are essentially getting privacy for free. On the other hand, you are wasteful in storing because you are replicating on many, many servers. So there's kind of a trade-off between uh, how much you have to store and how efficient you can be in your private download. And so the proofs of these kind of statements usually consist of two parts. So you have some information theoretic argument to get an upper bound so that you can't do better than this. And then you need to find a scheme that achieves this bound. We call this an achievable scheme, capacity achieving scheme. And I'm not giving you the full proof, but I give you a sketch of the scheme and then I give you a sketch of the information theoretic uh, converse proof. So assume we have two files A and B. Now I'm using a bit simpler notation because this is a very simple example. And we store this on two servers via replication. So we need to first split these files in n to the m, which is 4. Pieces, and even though, sorry, even though 4 is not a big number, n to the m will be a very big number in any pra practical setting, as you can probably believe. Apologies for the extra parentheses there. So we split this into subsymbols a1, a2, a3, a4, and b1, b2, b3, b4. And assume we want the file a, so we need this species a1, a2, a3, a4. And so how, how do we do this? A general strategy that works is that we download uh, a1 from the first server. So these q1 and q2 kind of denote what are the queries that we send to the two servers. Then to be kind of not too obvious, uh, we symmetrize over both servers. So we ask A2 from the second server. Then we need to not be obvious about wanting A and not B. So we need to also ask questions about B. And then we utilize this B as an interference. We want A so we can use these B pieces to cancel out this extra information. So we ask for some simple linear combinations from both servers and then we randomly permutate the indices to be even more confusing the servers. And turns out this scheme is private and it achieves the rate 2 over 3 and if we compare to the capacity expression on the previous slide, uh, it achieves the capacity for these parameters. And you can generalize this to do n to the n pieces and then do a lot of combinations and you can, you can imagine probably how it generalizes. And so now, uh, if you look at the converse, we would have to prove that our rate, so the number of desired symbols divided by the number of symbols downloaded, is at most this geometric uh, sum uh, here. So in other words, if you look at this reversed, the inverse of this, then we get that this would be at least this geometric sum over here. And now if we denote by L the size of the desired file, so this is the uh, denominator here then, we can multiply by L and we get that the number of symbols downloaded should be at least this much. So this is what we want to prove to get the upper bound. And the idea goes by uh, induction. So first of all, we need to download at least L symbols, otherwise we can't get our file which was of N symbols. And we do induction over the number of files. Uh, clear if we set M to be one, there's not much to prove. And then the induction step says that if you have m files and we want one of them and do want to disclose uh, which one, then we must download in total uh, dm uh, files, which is this uh, sum that we assumed. So in particular, from some of the servers, we need to download at least one nth. We have n servers, so at least one nth of this dm from the files uh, one to the m. And actually now I'm getting suspicious whether this is the final version of my slides, but let's ignore that. Luckily you don't know it. So the induction step, uh, now assume we want the file number m plus one, so the m, m plus first file, um, then by induction hypothesis, from some server we need dm over n symbols. And in addition we need to download l symbols from, from the m plus first file, because that was the file we want, so we need all the symbols of that file. So now what do we get in total is L plus dm over n. And when we simplify this expression, we see that it's going to be precisely what we claimed, dm plus one. So this proves the induction step. 
And now, of course, we need to be a bit careful here. Again, I'm talking about number of symbols. So if we are a bit precise, we should consider rather uh, mutual information or even further entropies of these uh, sizes of, or entropy of the file and entropy of the download. But let's not go to the information theoretic details, but this is kind of the intuition behind, behind the proof. And so then uh, this conjecture uh, that I mentioned, so we, we conjectured uh, in our first PIR paper that if we have an NKD coded storage system, uh, so a linear code, and we fix T, the number of colluding servers to be between one and N minus K, then any TPIR scheme, so a scheme protecting against T collusion, has a rate at most this expression here, and asymptotically being one minus K plus T minus one over N. So there's this penalty for uh, coding, and there's a penalty for the collusion. But again, if N is larger with respect to these things, then we can again approach approach one. So unfortunately, our uh, very nice conjecture was disproven in its kind of entirety, but on the other hand, not in a very severe manner, because the counterexample concerns a two PIR scheme for two files. Two files is a very special case. You are, I mean, if you have two files, you can also just download everything and be private, so it's in that sense not a very interesting example, but it is a counterexample regardless, and we have four servers. So they uh, showed a scheme with which they can achieve a PIR rate uh, 3 over 5, while our conjecture states 4 over 7, which is uh, smaller. And now what is interesting here is that this uh, proposed query scheme in the counterexample is not so-called full support rank. This was the technical assumption that we needed to prove our conjecture. So we have proved this uh, this conjecture in this special case with full support rank uh, schemes. I'll explain again a bit later what, what these schemes are. But just to give you a bit of summary of these capacities that we know, so here is the kind of most uh, general expression, and in red we have things that are on the level of conjecture or possibly proved in some uh, special case with some technical assumptions. And here in the uppermost one, if you go plugging in K is 1 as in for replication, T is 1 as in for no collusion, B is 0 as in no errors, R is 0 as in no struggling servers, then you get all these uh, other variants, simpler variants down here. And so, as I said, this asymptotic capacity is really the only interesting thing in practice because these uh, capacity, kind of finite capacity expressions decay exponentially fast in the number of files. So already with very small number of files, we are essentially talking about the asymptotic capacity. So it, in that sense, it doesn't really matter if we get to these finite capacities, but then of course being uh, mathematicians, we can be a bit stubborn of just proving something. So now, how did we then finally manage to prove at least something about these uh, conjectures is that we defined this so-called strongly linear uh, private information retrieval. So first, let's be a bit more specific uh, what I mean by uh, linear PIR. So first, a private information retrieval scheme is linear. If the responses are simply uh, coming with this inner product, so they are linear functions of the queries and the data being held by the servers. So in the binary case, XORing, for instance, just uh, projecting the data to the queries. So this was exactly what we did in the toy example. And then we say further that the scheme is strongly linear if in addition we can get each of, the, uh, each of the symbols in the file we want by a deterministic linear function so that it's not depending on the randomness that we use to provide the queries. We just simply need the responses. And why is this kind of property important? I already mentioned this before, but it allows us to have a small field size. We can essentially use read Solomon code, so we can just use uh, Q uh, n or a bit larger. And it has a low sub level. In this uh, Jafar replication scheme, you saw that we sub n to the M, uh, to n to the M fragments, whereas now we can do it just by uh, divide, subdividing into n times n minus k uh, fragments. So M has most importantly disappeared from here. And so then, how do we construct such a strongly linear scheme in practice? Then this was our first PIR paper that turned out quite 
successful, if I may say so myself, uh, was this kind of star product scheme that I will quickly walk you through now. So for two vectors, we defined the star product as just the kind of illegal multiplication of vectors, namely component-wise uh, multiplication of two vectors of the same length. And then for linear codes, we defined the star product code as the linear span of all such uh, star product vectors, where the first component is from the first code and the second component is from the second code. And we have something similar to uh, MDS codes for this. We have a product, sorry, linear codes for this kind of uh, star product codes. We have a product singleton bound saying that the minimum distance of the dual is at most uh, this expression here. And this will be very useful for us in terms of figuring out how many symbols we can download with this scheme. And we also know that apart from some kind of trivial uh, extremal cases, the only pairs that achieve this bound are generalized reed solomon codes. So that's the reason we are using, using those codes. So what we did uh, was kind of a, maybe fully general is a bit too much to say, but it's very general scheme in the sense that you can do it for any NK code, you can do it for any collusion, you can do it with any field size, at least a number of servers, which was something a bit new. And it turns out to be asymptotically capacity achieving at the known points. So we know the capacity when we have just replication or when we have no collusion. Uh, so this we can achieve uh, when employed with MDS uh, generalized read Solomon codes. We can use the scheme with many other types of codes as well, but those are the cases where we, where we can achieve these uh, capacities that are known. Uh, the star product scheme also achieves the uh, conjectured capacity. Uh, so the conjecture is from that very, very paper. And so what is kind of novel or was novel in the star product scheme is that, so if you recall the toy example, what happened was that I was sending these mm -hmm. random queries where I, where I picked my random vector from the whole vector space. So I picked uh, this length m very long vector from some vector space randomly and then I send it to the servers and I do this for all the end servers. So this is kind of a, let's say, vertical query structure in a sense. I pick these long, uh, is that vertical? Yes, long vertical vectors which I send to the servers. Now what we did is that we consider a query code, so a vector subspace which happens to be a linear code of length n. So now I'm thinking of my queries as kind of horizontal queries in a sense. So I'm picking a m of these code vectors of length n, and then I'm sending uh, these corresponding vectors to the servers. And so not just picking the queries from a code, but then somehow ensuring that this storage code that we happen to be using for storing the files and this query code that we picked, they somehow have a very nice interplay. And then after, after this, also the query code is what allows us to protect against any T collusion when the dimension is T. So this uh, scheme also happens to be strongly linear. And we can show, uh, show also that no strongly linear scheme can be essentially better than this star product scheme. So we can kind of cover the whole, uh, whole set of strongly linear schemes essentially by this star product scheme. And now I'm kind of repeating a very similar thing to the toy example, but using this star product scheme to hopefully uh, nail it down. So we are having, again, M files, and we have N servers, and these Y, I, J's are my encoded, encoded uh, pieces. So first row corresponds to the uh, first encoded vector, or encoded file, and the last piece corresponds to the Mth uh, encoded file. So I have encoded this system by some NKD code. You can think of, if you're familiar with Reed solomon codes, you can think of Reed solomon code. So then I select the code uh, D, and for every file, uh, I'm sending a, or choosing a code word from this query code D, uniformly at random, and then I'm adding again this indicator vector, which was earlier just a standard basis vector, telling which file I want. Now it's a bit more complicated, but the idea is exactly the same. This vector E is what kind of helps me to uh, decode the desired information. So then the queries that I sent, they are of this form. So 
Depending on if the index corresponds to the file that I want it, I have added some ej, some component of this e vector, otherwise I just have these plain uh, d code vectors. And I sent these queries to all the servers respectively. And what the servers respond with is that uh, they take these uh, inner products of the query they receive and the data they hold. I apologize for being so bad at pointing with this thing. Where is it? Maybe it's running out of battery. Anyway, so if we look at this um, kind of response vector, the overall response vector, we can see by a little bit of manipulation that it belongs into this uh, star product code, C star D. So C was the storage code, D was the query code, except that we have this little extra piece. So we had this indicator vector E to point to the file that we want. And then uh, that gets uh, start with the respective component yi. So essentially, this C star D part is kind of useless interference, whereas all the interesting information lies in this yi star E. So we can now uh, just kind of uh, project off the C star D, so we multiply it by the parity check matrix, and we are left with, with the desired information in yi star E. And now, uh, this scheme will be private even when considering T collusion. So if our code D has dimension D, uh, T, then what happens is that for a given uh, file L and a set of T servers that are colluding, T coordinates of this code word in D uh, is what they see. If L was not requested and if L was the requested one, then they see this uh, code word in D plus the vector E. And now, uh, what does it mean for them to retrieve some information? It basically means that they should distinguish i from l, so index that we wanted versus something we didn't want. And they can do that if they can decide which uh, or whether the coordinates come from this code word or have this e added to it. So now if we pick d as set so that any uh, it, it's of dimension d, meaning that any t columns of the generator matrix are linearly independent, then these two cases become indistinguishable because if you look at what they see is going to be uniformly distributed over this uh, FQ to the T space. So we are private, we can protect against any T collusion. And so what the user is receiving is a code word in C star D with some errors, this YI star E in some known positions because the user was the one who designed this E. You can think of it as an error vector. And we can treat these as erasers because we know the locations and then by having chosen this uh, C star D certain, in a certain way, we know that uh, it can correct certain number of errors. And now utilizing the product singleton bound, we can derive what exactly will be this uh, uh, bound for the minimum distance. It's going to be at most n minus k minus t plus 2 and using generalized reed solomon codes, we can get to this bound. So if you remember how the conjecture looked like, the asymptotic, I'm pointing again at the computer, the asymptotic uh, capacity was exactly this expression here. So now uh, just a tiny bit of, uh, how much time do I have? 15 minutes or so? Yes. yes. Okay, so then I have plenty of time. So now just to explain, um, oh, give you some of the actual results and explain you very quickly what the full support rank thing is. But first, um, about the strongly linear PIR. So now we can prove uh, by using this lemma uh, that the capacity achieved by strongly linear schemes is exactly what we achieve with the star product scheme. So consider any strongly linear PIR scheme. And if you have M files, then we denote by dij uh, this linear span of the row vectors qi to qn, which can occur at, as the jth row of the query matrix qi corresponding to the file index I that we are interested in. A bit um, maybe complicated, but punchline is that the rate that we achieve is uh, one minus this dimension divided by another dimension. And if you stare at these dimensions a bit, in the denominator, there's everything in this sum. So we are looking at these, all of these bands, and then starting with the storage code. And up here, we have excluded the index that corresponds to what we want. So basically, here is all the responses we get and all the kind of extra information. Uh, sorry, all the information and up here we only have kind of the interference. So this is kind of what is uh, downloaded as in a way too much. 
And if we want to simplify a bit, we can assume that all the servers sent a similar size response and then it will look a little bit nicer because this is then just downloading a number of symbols corresponding to this dimension, which will be n, and the other dimension remains the same. And um, as said, we can replace any such strongly linear scheme by a star product scheme uh, without losing in the PIR rate. So this uh, is kind of what we can what we can prove. So if we look at the dimensions a bit better and we utilize uh, uh, utilize the sorry, I got confused. Yes. So then we, then we get essentially exactly what we had with the uh, star product code, computing what these dimensions, what the bounds for these dimensions will become. And as said, it coincides with the asymptotic uh, capacity, should say conjecture, capacity conjecture, we haven't proven it in its entirety yet. And also it's true for any number of files. So even though, so this expression of capacity is the asymptotic one, but we can get to it with any number of files because the rate is independent of the number of files if we are strongly linear. And so, <coughs> if we think about it, it's kind of clearly suboptimal to send linearly dependent queries to the servers. So now maybe, okay, I should give a little bit of a bridge. So now we got to the, kind of got to the asymptotic expression, but how would we achieve the kind of finite version that had the number of files m in it? Then these full support rank schemes come into play. So now how we kind of ended up with, with this kind of technical def definition is that, uh, as I just said, it is suboptimal to send linearly dependent queries to the servers because it means that you are essentially downloading redundant information. So if I already downloaded some symbol A1, then I don't want to download it again because it increases my communication cost and I gain new, no new information. However, if you look at the query matrices, then sub-matrices of these query matrices may still be dependent, so they may have supported columns that are linearly dependent. And now this technical assumption of full support rank exactly uh, restricts all the supported columns, at most T of them, uh, T being the collusion uh, size, to be independent. Again, Definition is quite technical, you can kind of safely ignore it. I try to explain on an intuitive level what it means and what are the consequences. But here it is just for the sake of uh, completeness. So basically we say that a scheme is full support rank if for every query realization Q in this uh, vector space, any subset among the n servers of size at most the collusion, size, uh, collusion limit and any file index J uh, we have that the rank, rank of this submatrix kind of these are just the sub, sub matrices in this query matrix co corresponding to some alpha rows and beta columns. If this rank is the same as the column support of the same, same matrix. So this is why we call it full support rank scheme. Those of you who are in love with all kinds of linear algebra, it's probably very easy to grasp this, but if it looks complicated, then just ignore the technicalities. And now uh, we can prove that the capacity of these kind of full support rank schemes uh, using NK MDS coded storage and tolerating T colluding servers is exactly coinciding with our earlier conjecture. So what was uh, to kind of save our conjecture, we need to add this full support rank assumption there. And the converse, I won't go through the proof, but it follows uh, pretty much the proof for the symmetric case uh, by Wang and Skuglund with some additional lemmas that we had to prove. And then an achievable scheme getting to this bound can be constructed by using our star product scheme and then this kind of uh, lifting and refinement, refinement procedure introduced by uh, Rafael Oliveira and Salim El Rohayep. So this proof settles the earlier conjecture for these linear PIR schemes for this special case of full support rank schemes. And as said earlier, these full support rank schemes, they seem to cover almost everything. All the capacity, we, capacity achieving schemes we know, they are full support rank. It's only this one counter example for two files by um, Sunat Safar, uh, which doesn't satisfy this assumption. 
So uh, how to interpret this is kind of these results give some insight towards what we need still to be able to prove a fully general capacity expression, which obviously won't be this one because we have the counterexample. The asymptotic expression could still hold even in the general case. So for instance, now in this kind of simplest uh, approaches, including this star product scheme, we achieve privacy through ensuring that any t tuple of servers gets these uni uniformly distributed vectors. And they achieve the asymptotic capacity uh, expression and allow for small subpacketization, but they don't achieve these finite capacity expressions. So then we kind of need to give up this certain simplicity here. So on the other hand, these schemes that are able to achieve the finite uh, capacities, they are based on querying for very specific, carefully handpicked pieces of encoded files that, for instance, in the replicated example where uh, n to the m fragments that we had to split the files and then query about all of these. So here the queries received by these t-tuples, they are no longer uniformly distributed over all vectors. For instance, the all zero vector will never be there. And the, also the only general scheme that gets to these uh, finite bounds in the coded colluded case is exactly based on this kind of uh, very specific construction. So now the natural choice to get privacy is to require the supported position to be linearly independent. And this is, like I said already, probably too many times, is exactly what the concept of full support rank captures. So now, finally, <laughs> our results show that if we want to exceed the rate uh, that the full support rank schemes can get, it is necessary for some restrictions uh, of these queries to be uh, to the subsets of these uh, colluding servers to be dependent. And then being dependent, this will be somehow feels much harder to have some general construction such that you have some kind of dependency that in general gives you something higher. And of course, uh, so this was what they did in the counter example for two files. But unfortunately, uh, even though you would maybe think that, okay, let's just kind of generalize their counterexample, this seems very difficult. You can kind of pretty easily generalize it for different n and k, but to increase the number of files from two that would actually make it relevant, this seems very difficult. You can do some kind of generalization, but it doesn't achieve a good rate. So now then maybe one could try to prove that if, um, Either these kind of dependent schemes uh, can't do better, except in some special case of two files, or then one should actually go and find these uh, dependent query constructions. Okay, so finally I'll start concluding, running out of time soon. So hopefully I managed to give you a bit of introduction to private information retrieval, especially in the case of coded, coded storage, that was our main interest. Uh, I defined the concept of strongly linear and full support rank uh, PIR, and these concepts help us to prove some coded colluding capacity results that have been open for several years already. And the strong linearity, uh, or as said, can be replaced by our star product scheme with, without any loss. This is nice in practical terms because we can use just Fritz Solomon codes, have small field sizes, and low sub packetization, no need to split the files so much. Also what is nice about the star product scheme that it's highly generalizable. We can consider it for struggling servers, Byzantine servers, over random linear networks, uh, streaming data, uh, quantum private information retrieval, you name it. And what is there still to be done? There's, uh, I guess, quite many things you can create infinitely, many scenarios that you can consider, but maybe, at least from my point of view, the most interesting things are uh, maybe this is a bit biased, but this general lin linear PIR capacity with coded colluding servers and possibly adding Byzantine servers. Also would be interesting to see if some non-linear scheme can do better. And then the capacity of PIR over networks. So we have some schemes over random linear networks, but we have no idea like if they are good or what is the capacity or so on. Uh, then maybe also in terms of practicality, because now uh, you notice that these servers are kind of computing a lot. They are taking these uh, inner products of everything they are storing with your query file. And as I said, we have many, many files. Then this becomes maybe, can become a bit infeasible. So then how can we get around this complexity is of course, 
You can do parcel privacy. If I have 100,000 files, maybe it's enough that I'm private among 1,000 files, and then it's suddenly maybe much more feasible. But in general, more practical schemes with some computation thresholds that you can't afford doing more computation than a certain uh, threshold, this would be very interesting. And private keyword search is another topic. Then a little bit deviating from PIR, but somehow having some similar features, so possibly some areas where we can utilize PIR, a private computation and function retrieval, secure distributed matrix multiplication, and distributed and federated learning. These are some further emerging topics. Then some references, apologies that I'm not citing everything and everyone. I still have seven pages of them. <laughs> so thank you very much, happy to receive questions and here's repeated ad for our doctoral network if you missed it yesterday. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the interesting talk. Any questions? or comments. Was crystal clear. Right. Yeah, uh, thanks for this nice presentation. So uh, in your information retrieval scheme, uh, your information retrieval scheme in fact triggered me to think of and consider of uh, lot space encryption. So in your star product case, is there a relationship between uh, your information retrieval scheme and uh, such kind of lot space encryption, LWE encryption schemes? Sorry, what encryption schemes? I mean, lot space encryption. Oh, so space they are. Encryption schemes. Yeah, do you have some adding errors and uh, multiplying with star products? So yeah. it triggered me to think of such kind of schemes are similar. Yeah, so actually, I don't know in the case of star product uh, PIR, but there, there are some papers um, on this computational PIR based on lattices. And we also did something with code-based crypto type of ideas, but it was uh, broken pretty immediately by Gianira and uh, some other people, so that didn't fly. So these kind of computational PIR schemes can definitely utilize uh, these kind of uh, concepts as well. But I'm not sure if the star product scheme then... I mean, it's a natural way to think yeah, about as this. As you know, but star, yeah. star product is nothing but uh, polynomial multiplication in terms yeah. of... Yeah. yeah, yeah, so definitely can, can consider that. What about oblivious transfer? Is it cryptographical hard problem side of this uh, concept? So oblivious transfer? Yeah, that I don't know if, it, if something has been utilized for this purpose, but yeah, I think like in principle for the computational PIR, any hard problem that you manage to utilize, why not? If, it, if you end up with uh, good retrieval rates with not too much computational complexity, yeah. I guess any, anything can be uh, considered. I'm not so familiar with the computational side of the works. Are there other questions or comments? If not, let's thank the speaker again and thank you uh, to all speakers this morning.